things like exploring Pluto. And in fact, the United States has a space infrastructure that can do things that no other country can do to explore Pluto, Neptune. We can have confidence about sending a spacecraft to Mercury. But there is one area of our space program that is really key to, to exploring space and become a space ferry nation that we really don't have. And I think it can be best illustrated by some comparisons of a country that does have something like this. A country that's falling apart, yet they have an excellent uh, space program as far as it goes. As far as getting into orbit, delivering cargo to space, and having a low-cost space station and have lots of manned experience, the Soviet Union has done very well. Um, I've been very lucky. I've had some unusual experience. Whereas most people have a, an experience where they have one thing that they look at for years and years, I had the opportunity to spend five years of a Vandenberg Air Force Base launching American rockets in which the sun rose and set on Delta rocket family, the Atlas rocket family, the Titan rocket family. And then I had another chance to spend five years uh, directly observing the Soviet Union space uh, infrastructure in which the sun rose and set on the Proton, the Vostok family, Cosmos, and Cyclone. And if you look at this, what's the basic difference between a Proton and a Titan? Well, the cost is very obviously. Russian space uh, rockets are roughly seven to eight times less expensive than American-built rockets. It's somewhat obvious here, but uh, there's different ways of pricing things. An awful lot of the cost of Russian rockets uh, includes the payloads. They very often include the payloads with the cost of the rocket. Uh, they have a lot of capacity, as you can see. But another very interesting one is, uh, is on how reliable they are. We think that we have a very reliable system because we have great technology. We put great care into these rockets. But it doesn't seem to be borne out by the numbers. They have, seem to have about half as many proton failures as we have uh, Titan failures. And that's probably a reasonable number, except, well, maybe the Russians are really a little better than they show. Of those five failures they've had, three of them have been with the fourth stage on the SL-12, and those were, were an early major change to it. So their failure rate with the proton is really much lower than it looks. And perhaps the Titan's slightly more reliable than it shows there, but not much more. Next one is uh, our best rocket, as far as reliability, is the Delta. One, one failure in uh, 50 uh, attempts through the 1980s, 1990. That's a good record. Probably it's about 98% reliable. And uh, the Cyclone, while it shows 100% reliable, more than twice as many launches, no failures, it's probably 99 to 99.5% reliable. It's a very good one. They, again, look at the cost differences. Same class of vehicles, a five times difference in cost. And then we come up to the next one, which is the one I concentrated most on, the Vostok. Vostok is the basic rocket that puts Sputnik up. Every single cosmonaut that has ever gone to orbit has gone up on a Vostok. It's the SL-4, the mainstay of, uh, of the Russian military. The Russians launched one Vostok per week for 22 years on average a huge effort to get this thing up. Maybe it wasn't such a huge effort. They have a cost of 15 million uh, and a, a very good payload capacity. Maybe it wasn't such a, a big effort after all because it'll, it turns out that they spend about only about 10% of that cost is manufacturing the rocket. And we'll see why they manufacture that rocket so inexpensive. Well, that was kind of a pre-introduction. A lot of people think the problem on getting to space is we don't have enough money. I look at the other way around. We've already shown that the Russians seem to have a, uh, a very reliable space program uh, that's very, very reliable. But you know, it, can we do the same sort of thing? Can we go back to the previous stage of the slide? It's got one, one major point. By the way, the, this is almost an astounding number, 99.83%. People don't believe that number, that the Russians can have only one failure in 592, whereas we, we would lose roughly, if we tried 1,000 launches, for example, more than 100 would fail. Well, actually, that number isn't right. The Russians, everybody knows, they had some of the failures. Actually, during this period of time, they had two failures. But you can figure that a Russian rocket of that size, one launch per week, 
you'll wait around five or six years before you finally see a failure. And in fact, since they've, they've launched something like almost 1,500 of them successfully, they've run out every failure mode there is. Okay. So what I'm looking for is a way not of getting more money for space, but using what we have much more cost effectively, getting a lot more for what we have. And what I'm presenting at NASA headquarters, and this is, by the way, a, uh, the slides I'll be using, or I'll actually be uh, consolidating and uh, condensing them slightly. Uh, I'll be making a presentation at NASA headquarters on September 1st through 4th, sometime in that time period, back in Washington, D.C. And what I'm looking for is a uh, way of, of making the cost of getting to space with expendable rocket vehicles much lower, not just to an order of magnitude, like 10 times lower, but even far, far lower than that, because it is possible. A reliability enhancement. Why should we design rockets as they are in the NLS with a reliability budget that allows 3.5 failures per 100 missions? That's what they do. They give a reliability budget. They allow that many failures. And early on, there will be some, some design errors that will cause even more failures. They're building this thing right on the margin. I think you can build rockets virtually for a 100% success rate, just like we build airplanes to do that. You'll pay a penalty, but the penalty may not be that severe after all. And dependability uh, enhancement. One very interesting thing and experience I had from watching these rockets uh, take off from the Soviet Union. They always went off on time. The first time Westerners were allowed to go to Tyre Tam to see, to see a Russian rocket uh, take off, uh, so I'm told, there was a blizzard. The airplane couldn't land at Tyre Tam, so the Westerners couldn't see this launch, but the rocket went on time. The rockets leave Placetsk at minus 55 degrees in a blizzard. They leave Tyre Tam 105 degrees in a sandstorm in the summer. And they don't have delays. They don't wait 15 or 20 minutes for things to clear up a little bit. If it's time to go, they push that button and off they go. That's, that's a kind of dependability. They, they will tell you what day they're going to launch it months in advance, and when you show up on that day, it will go. They don't have delays. I don't think they have the ability to delay a launch. They also roll this thing out uh, a few hours before launch in the horizontal position, roll it out, put it up to the vertical position, fuel it, and launch it, just like clockwork. We just don't have anything like that within our infrastructure. Okay. This is a uh, picture of Russian engines. That's the SL4 engine cluster. Uh, the RD-107, RD-108 cluster. Uh, pretty simple looking engines, actually. That's in Moscow. Uh, among the features, on the very top looks like a keg of beer. That's their turbo pump. That's a pretty good sized turbo pump. If you notice American built engines, you can barely find the turbo pump on an engine. It's very small. They run a very high RPM. It takes very fine machining. Clearly, the Russians do things like this. They have a big turbo pump. Uh, it runs at a lot slower uh, RPM. It takes ordinary machining, not extraordinary machining. It's a lot bigger. And, but they also have a problem building these particular turbo pumps. That's the most uh, exotic thing they have on all the rocket engines. What is a rocket engine? It's, it's a one-cylinder engine without a piston. It's a very simple thing, basically. They find the only thing that's hard to make is a turbo pump. So they build one turbo pump, and they do all the pumping to four engines, the main cluster, plus all the vernier engines. So they share the turbo pump. That's the one thing they have a hard time making. Now, by the way, on the SL4, as we'll see on here, they have not one of those clusters of four engines, but they have five. So they've got 20 main engines like that lifting off. And remember, they're sending these up at one a week. 20 engines per week they're making. There's not an American main engine that enjoys a production rate of even 12 per year and hasn't been for years. Here's a sideways of <laughs> look of a, an American engine. I believe that's the... Uh, no, it's not the F1, the next one down. The H1, is it? The yeah. one that Saturn, uh, the Saturn 1B. Uh, that's really a very complex engine. We have built with all this tubing in here, which carries fuel to carry away all the heat. It has a lot of leak valves. It's, that's a really a plumbing nightmare. Now, the question I have, if we want to make engines cheaper, one thing you might be able to do is, you might, if you could, if you could uh, build the engines, can you make it simpler than this? And an answer I come up with is yes, because here's a Russian engine, very similar. Now there's two things that really drive the cost of a rocket vehicle. The 
turbo pumps are very expensive on American rockets. And all the rest of the things in the engine are equally expensive, but they're driven by the complexity of the turbo pumps, making those small, high power densities. The Russians solve that by having fewer of them on there. Um, although they make clusters of many small engines, which builds up their production rate. Uh, the second thing that drives vehicle costs is steering. And the Russians solve this in a very simple way. These main engines don't move. There's no gimbals, there's no hydraulics, there's no auxiliary power units. All they have is these smaller vernier engines on the side, and those vernier engines swivel. It's a lot easier to swivel something than it is to build a movement in two degrees by using hydraulic actuators. It's a fairly simple way of moving the, uh, this particular rocket. Uh, third, you see a lot of tubes in that engine. It's not built up by a cluster of tubes. It's a fairly simple engine. It's, got, it's made of low-grade stainless steel. It's welded, has copper lining, and the Russians do something we don't do. Uh, they use, uh, they usually use things like locks as a coolant because there's a lot more locks. It's colder in the first place. It's a great way of doing things. They are doing things in a different manner and have turned out to, that they have a product that is much lower in cost and turns out to be very reliable. Why is it reliable? If you're an engineer, you're given a mass budget, a reliability budget, and you have to stay within that and you're going to try to shave off every ounce, get as much performance as possible out of this. Make your turbo pump as small as possible. Bring the RPMs up to do it. So it's right on the edge of coming apart. The Russians don't do that. They say, we'll make this thing nice and hefty, thick. If there's any doubt about that breaking, we'll make it heavier. They give up some performance. But what they're really trading off is kerosene, which runs at 12 cents a pound, liquid oxygen, which runs about 3.4 cents a pound, for expensive machinery. Instead of making expensive engines, what these are are very, very inexpensive engines. Okay. And the Russians do something that we don't. We are an engineering-oriented space satellite uh, nation. As you look at all the various satellites we go, we put up, and we put up a lot of satellites, a lot of space probes going to this planet or that, or, or Earth orbiting satellites. Every one of them is custom made. The Russians don't do that. Every every one of those 52 per year SL4s that they put up had a capsule that's somewhat like this. This is a Soyuz. You put a man inside it. They didn't make a new spacecraft every time they had an application. If they wanted to bring up supplies to the space station, they'd have a capsule that looked very similar to that, and in fact was just a, a variant of it, and they'd call it a progress. And it would autonomously bring up supplies to the space station. If they wanted to uh, see what we were doing, the cameras in the window, and it would be a, a reconnaissance satellite. If they wanted to put a monkey or dog in it, it would be a biosat. <clears throat> but they would use the same basic spacecraft over and over again and they'd make 50 copies of this per year. Which means that what they were doing is they were just doing what we do best. We build a lot of automobiles, they don't. They build a lot of spacecraft. They take one design and they do it over and over again. All that engineering cost is saved. And in fact, if you do that, the cost of manufacturing these things go down because you gain a lot of experience. So looking at the system differences, Basically, uh, the United States is an, an, an engineering-oriented space nation. Everything is custom done. All our spacecraft, and, and really, in all seriousness, our rockets are custom-made rockets. Even though we've produced close to 250 deltas, 250 uh, atlases for uh, space launch, and 250 uh, uh, titans, they're basically still built in a custom-made uh, atmosphere. The Russians have done it in a factory-type atmosphere. Uh, they accept suboptimal performance and make the rockets bigger. That's easy enough to do. We uh, take all of our spacecraft and optimize them to the very uh, highest standards so we make it as light as possible. The idea is that if you make it really light, since it costs so much to get into orbit, it should save money in theory. But I think uh, the evidence seems to prove that that's exactly opposite of the truth. And here we look at the end of the uh, Soviet SL-4 which kind of shows uh, what we're talking about, uh, high production rate. Firing one of these things into space uh, every week, carrying seven and a half tons of cargo, has 20 main engines. You're building about four of those engines per, per day, per work day. You've got 12 vernier engines, you're making about three vernier engines per day in production. 
That's high production rate, but by our standards, it'd be huge production rates. Uh, you have five identical boosters that strap on and fall off. The American way of doing things is minimize the number of boosters. Minimize the number of engines by making them large. The Russian way is to make them smaller and mass produce them. Strap them on. And so, just to summarize the main difference is that uh, the Russians have done something we'd give a lot of uh, lip service to, modularity. Their rockets are, very, are highly modular. Uh, they have engines that are used over and over again. We have a single, uh, if, you, if we build a part in a rocket, it's found in the rocket only ones, maybe twos. You find, uh, you look at theirs, they put 15 and 20 of the same thing on a rocket, sometimes more. A few designs, many copies. That's the way the Russians do it. We have, uh, have a design for every copy we make. And so, if I was to try to summarize what the main difference between the Russian uh, rockets and American rockets are, it would be primarily in modularity, which allows them to go way down the, the line of learning curve and economies of scale, high production rate, and further, here's another thing is, why do the Russians have so few failures? That puzzled me for a long time. If you look at the rocket engines, they're really pretty junky, and you can't explain it in terms of simplicity alone. And the curves wouldn't fit until you started realizing, wait, they have 20 main engines, so every time they launch 100 of these, they're not testing that engine 100 times, they're testing that engine 2,000 times. And they're ringing out these failure modes. And suddenly, if you use this as a criteria and try their reliability curves, yes, indeed, this rocket should be successful in about 99.8% of the time. Whereas an American built rocket should be about 95%. In other words, they're having perhaps two failures per thousand would be a reasonable amount. One to two failures per thousand. And we're having more in the neighborhood of 50 failures per thousand. What a difference. <coughs> well, uh, having this background, uh, I thought, should we look into this a little bit more? Uh, maybe there's some other things we can look at. Are American rockets, are there other ways of making them less, less expensive? And I did a series of uh, trade studies which are uh, uh, summarized here and came out with one principle is that you want to have a multi-stage rocket. You know, we have the technology and the ability to make a single stage door, but it's really nice. And a eight or 900,000 pound gross lift off weight rocket, single stage door, but will carry about 10,000 pounds to orbit. You can do the same thing with a kerosene liquid oxygen rocket that has a fraction of the performance if you use three stage. In fact, uh, an Atlas weighs half what the SSTO will weigh and has engine performance that's a fraction of, of the SSTO, yet it makes it to orbit with a much bigger payload. LOX kerosene is a propellant of choice. Uh, we've never built an American built rocket that, for which propellant starts becoming significant, with the exception of solid rocket motors. And I find it interesting that solid rocket motors, by the way, solid fuel is very expensive. It's about four to six dollars a pound in the case. Uh, solid rockets have to, by just by the nature, be hefty and inefficient. You have to have very thick cases, so they can't perform as well because it can't be built thin like a like a liquid rocket uh, can liquid rocket vehicle has, is much, much lighter. <clears throat> Solid rocket uh, propellants just aren't as energetic, or at least they don't, they don't have, uh, perform as well as, as most liquid fuels. And yet, in America, solid rockets are very cost effective. Why is it? They've kind of made them very, very simple. <clears throat> How cost effective are they? Take a Titan, for example. A Titan may be a $200 million vehicle if you strap with the solid rocket motors uh, on them. If you don't have the solid rocket motors, it's a $150 million vehicle. It'll carry about 8,000 pounds to orbit. You put those $50 million solid rocket motors on it, and you quadruple the payload to about 32,000 uh, pounds. That's cost effective. For some reason, solid rocket motors are cost effective, but we haven't been able to build uh, liquid uh, cost effective uh, systems. Well, LOX kerosene is turns out to be uh, probably one of the better propellants to use because it's inexpensive, 
It's easy to handle. It's common. It's found everywhere in the world. Very, very cheap. It's a combination. It's about seven cents a pound. Uh, it doesn't have the handling problems of uh, liquid hydrogen. People like that as a fuel. Boy, liquid hydrogen is great. You can get 50% more performance from a liquid hydrogen engine. But a gallon of liquid hydrogen weighs about nine ounces. So you have to have huge tanks. Now, I would much rather trade away seven cent a pound kerosene and liquid oxygen for paying than pay this huge amount you pay for these very large, very heavy, uh, very hefty tanks with a lot of uh, insulation that holds liquid hydrogen. Pressure fed engines. I've said before that uh, turbo pumps appear to be the real cost drivers of engines and engines are the cost drivers on making vehicles expensive. Uh, if you remove the turbo pumps, you're really cutting only about 45% of the cost out of an engine. But what it does is it allows you to build the engine differently. You finally make an engine very simply and very inexpensively. Uh, maximum modularity, and that's from the Russian lessons. A balloon tank. Uh, is anybody familiar with the Atlas missile? It's built with uh, stainless steel sheets at the bottom. They're 41 one thousandths of an inch thick, 25 sheets to an inch. At the top, if you use the old uh, E and F versions, which neck down, the, it drops down to about 11 thousandths of an inch thick. 91 sheets of the stainless steel per inch, very, very thin. There's nothing behind it. This has no structure. There are no, there are no stringers. There are no ribs. There are nothing behind it. When you build this thing, this must have really terrified the Atlas, uh, the astronauts like John Glenn that went aboard one when they walk into the factory to see one of them being manufactured. And what, what is that out there? It looks like a prune. It looks like it's already had a crash. It hasn't. Once they pump this thing up, it becomes, it, all the wrinkles pop out and it seems to be rigid. But it's only rigid as long as there's pressure inside it. Now, if you're going to have a pressure fed engine, you're going to have to have high pressure tanks. So why not combine the advantage of both, have a balloon type tank that's thicker to hold the higher pressure, and therefore easier to handle and easier to fabricate than an Atlas tank would be. Because an Atlas tank, because of the thinness and no frame to wrap it on, is fairly hard to build, although it's still the cheapest tank you can possibly come up with, and the lightest. Uh, so all those attributes uh, point to a balloon tank for such a vehicle. And if you're talking about uh, tanks that have to withstand 500 PSI, they're a lot stiffer than Atlas tanks and have a lot easier ground handling. But you can leave out a lot of the structure to it. Let the high pressure inside this be the structure. When you pump pressurize anything to 500 PSI, it's stiff as a rock. It's not going to buckle. <clears throat> Parallel burn. If you want an architecture that's really reliable, it's really nice to have all the engines light up before you leave the ground. Uh, most failures, that, or a lot of failures that occur, are on staging when you try to light a stage off in space. They've got it done pretty good, but that's a high failure mode. Uh, Design things to existing low-cost commercial standards. Everything in the aerospace industry is very expensive. Uh, the only way to get around that is to, why can't you design something so it can be built not by an aerospace firm in a, in a clean room, but by uh, a company that can sell things to us terrestrial people. I see no reason, as I've gone through this, why that can't be done. And let's face it, aerospace products, pound for pound, are 100 to 1,000 times more expensive than the same thing that we use on the ground. The aerospace product is finely engineered and very, very light, as light as you can make it. Commercial products, a little heavier, but a lot more robust. I've tried to use as an illustration on that. Take a car radio. That's a commercial product. People say, well, there's no commercial product that's as, that's as robust as our space thing. It goes through radiation. It goes through these environments. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Nothing as rough as a car radio, and you're in Anchorage, Alaska, you turn it's 50 below zero, you turn on the radio, you can't get the engine started, but you've got music. The tires are almost flat because it's so cold, and the tires are hard. You come down the Alcan Highway, the vibrations on that thing are so bad, your fillings want to come out, but you still have music. You park your car in Phoenix, Arizona, you roll up the windows. With a greenhouse effect, it gets to be 160 degrees in that car, and you leave your pooch in, go shopping for a couple hours, come out, your dog's history, but you've got music that's all you. Now, a lot of commercial products are much more robust than, than uh, the specifications for any space-grade product. And space is not a bad environment to be in. 
uh, probably the worst is low earth orbit as far as thermal cycling and you have a lot more radiation as you get into the inter intermediate altitudes. But all that can be compensated for even with commercial grade products. <coughs> uh, maximum use of off the shelf hardware. Back in 1989, I was assigned to uh, be a program manager on this little computer that was going to go aboard the ALS. It wasn't going to launch until 1997. We were supposed to build this 32 bit computer in 1989 to fly in 1997. I thought, well, the way computer technology is going, why don't they wait until 1995 and buy it off the shelf? And I also looked around, and does anybody else make such a computer? And with the exception of a few uh, custom chips that would have to be made to adapt this to our purposes, the answer was yes, those three other aerospace manufacturers were building something that met our specifications almost precisely. Why not use the off the shelf instead of reinvent, reinventing the wheel a lot? Let's use a lot in the aerospace industry. Let's not reinvent the wheel, but they do. I don't think you have to have high technology, by the way, to be innovative. Well, the next to last bullet. Why not use innovation and do things smart, work smart, not hard? But it doesn't necessarily mean you have to have a brand new technology to do it. We can use existing technology in new ways. In fact, that's what, what this presentation will lead to. And no dependence on reusability. I think the uh, National Space Society sees a lot of reusability as eventual key. And yes, that's true. Eventually, we shouldn't have to throw away rockets. But in this day and age, and for the next few years to come, it does not pay to uh, recycle rocket vehicles. It just doesn't work out for two reasons. First of all, uh, something like the space shuttle built to care to be able to reuse is four to five times as expensive pound for pound as an expendable vehicle. And the second thing, it has an awful lot of overhead. Uh, the space shuttle is a 100 ton vehicle that can carry 20 tons of cargo. That's a lot of overhead. There's a lot of tiles and tires and other things you have to take up that are there just to get the whole thing back. Too much overhead on the reusability. That means that basically, uh, if you used the space shuttle 30 times and didn't have any in-between maintenance on it, or used an expendable vehicle about the same size uh, um, once, both would be about equally cost-effective. So reusability is not really there, especially since when you look at the way they really do it, when the space shuttle comes back, they essentially overhaul it each time. I'll tell you, I would not be able to come here and make this presentation if when I came here, I had to have my car overhauled, and when I drove back, I had to have it overhauled again. And I wouldn't have even tried it if there was only about a 98% chance of being here alive. Okay. So in looking at the Russian system, which at first I, th I thought of simplification as one of their keys, and it turned out that I think clusters is more important. But uh, simplification seemed like a great idea until I looked into the American aerospace industry and I found a lot of very simple things that were very expensive. Example, and I, don't, I didn't bring the slide picture of it, but uh, an 11 gallon spacecraft uh, propellant tank, just about this big around, a pretty, pretty large beat crawl basically, had no moving parts and it cost half a million dollars. Uh, space shuttle pre valve, it's a 12 inch gate valve, you can pay about 100 $200 for one that you have on the farm that will open up 12 inches of water to come through or close it down. This one, it costs $150,000 a piece, and it operates on less pressure. Uh, so it's not just a matter of simplification, uh, although if you do have simplification, you can go a long ways. And then this, this is an exploded view of a particular part. Doesn't, if that was commercial, it would, you'd probably, well, in fact, this thing would fit in my hand. I can't carry it. Because these parts, which are mostly common things we know about, washers, these are all washers, springs, um, rocker arms, a lot, of, a lot of washers and spacers, a little aluminum box. The only thing that is really electronic in it is these little four switches on the end. And that's a payload bay switch and the space shuttle. Just the parts, this isn't assembled. The parts, $10,528 in 1988. <laughs> you could go to the hardware store and find uh, parts like that and you'd probably spend $12, $15. So simplification isn't necessarily the answer. There's something more that has to go into it. And this is the process that I basically use to formulate a workable strategy. 
And the first thing is a sensible and forgiving architecture. Something that is not like the single stage to orbit where a little bit of performance taken away will make the thing just not quite work, be a showstopper. Uh, has to have some forgivingness. It also has to be done in a way that it will, that will lead to low cost, so it can reach low, uh, low cost. And you get there through simplification and more, and if you then want to bring the cost down even more, you can use more forgiving margins, which will allow you to use an industrial grade rather than space grade uh, production methods. Use off the shelf if you can. <clears throat> I'd like also to use, to design this thing, not for the highest performance, which is universally what happens in the aerospace business. And what performance do you want this thing designed to? We'll meet it. But rather for the lowest cost. And I found very, very few examples where low cost is even attempted and no instance where low cost within the aerospace industry has been achieved. Uh, then look for alternatives to some of these expensive processes. You shouldn't be able to say, well, we'll design a rocket engine. Oh, there it is, optimum. Now, how do we build it? Well, we have to use a five-axis mill to grind out this material here the way, the way it is in the drawing. Uh, all these expensive processes. Come up with a way of deciding the processes first and then designing the engine around existing industrial processes rather than designing the engine to be optimized and then figuring out how we're going to build this puppy. Selection of low-cost materials. You've got to want to stay away from things like beryllium and lithium and some of these very expensive things. These should be, if you want to have some of this low-cost, you need to have reasonable materials, things that are not going to bank with the treasury just, just for these exotic things. That precludes uh, many composite parts unless it's handled in a, in a wise way. Um, cluster, build this thing out of clusters of modules the way the Russians do. In fact, my assessment was they, they're, they're onto something there, but they didn't go far enough. They can go further. In fact, the uh, Soviet SL-12, the Proton, it has a cluster of six engines around it, not four, not four boosters, but six. Uh, as you get this clusters of modules, you're getting a higher production rate. You get more, uh, more learning curve. And learning curve and economies of scale are two different things. You can't have economies of scale when you're custom building things. Twelve engines a year, that's not economies of scale. You've got a shop in which you're custom making things. If you build up your production rate, and you can do it by having larger numbers of modules on each vehicle, uh, then you can actually start producing things in an industrial manner, <coughs> build a plant size to build that number, and be very efficient. Pop these things up, chunk, 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 the way we're used to seeing things come off the assembly line. And learning curve effect with continuous processing improvement is independent of that. That's saying that as we build these things in greater numbers, the more we build, the more we learn about how to build them less expensive and build them better. Fewer failures, lower cost together at the same time. That's something new in the American aerospace industry. The lower the cost is, the more reliable it is. They think of the other way around. Uh, and then once you've, as you go through this iteration, you finally end up with low cost. Low cost increases demand. In demand, finally you get that feedback loop that most people skip over to say that if you bring rockets down, we'll, we'll get this kind of loop. Well, you really can. Uh, if you have low-cost rockets, you're going to have new applications that just aren't economic unless the cost is low enough. You know what it costs to get into orbit on an American-built rocket? It costs about $5,000 a pound at the minimum on a Delta or an Atlas or a Titan. And it costs about $36,000 a pound on a Scout. Space shuttle someplace in between. You think about that. If, if you came up to the Mafia and said, here's beach sand, we've got a process, we'll, we'll send this to space and it'll turn into cocaine, and when it comes back you can sell it on the street at street prices, they'd have to say no because it's not economic. It costs too much. It costs more than its weight in gold to send things up into orbit. That's the beginning price. If you, as you bring this thing down, now some industrial processes of building crystals, pharmaceuticals, uh, uh, university experiments that just can't pay the millions of dollars to get up there, suddenly they become much more economic. Furthermore, uh, your aerospace uh, grade, which is trying to make everything as light as possible because it's so expensive to get up there, you can start uh, allowing relaxation of the mass standards. The payloads can get a little heavier. They can use off-the-shelf materials instead of pruning off every ounce to make it much less expensive, and demand would tend to go up. And that would feed back to increase the numbers you'll have in, higher learning curve, higher economies of scale, uh, and so forth on. And that would, that would be, be a, an example of new applications.
Now then, of course, if you're going to go through all these iterations and decide how a rocket can be, you have to do a point design of saying, well, what would this thing look like? And this is the design it came up with. It doesn't look very pretty, pretty good. But it's a, it's a uh, series of seven nearly identical rockets. You can see the six around the perimeter. The center one will also be identical. All engines fire at the same time. The only thing distinctly different about this particular architecture is I have I designed in a special manifold on the bottom of this thing such that all the propellant for all the engines under all seven rockets come from only two tanks at a time. Let's say this one here and this one. And where they're empty, they drop off. Engines and all. And the other five segments, it's called segments, instead of our rockets in the vehicle, continue completely full of propellant. Say this time we're drawing propellant this one and this one. Making these three in a row uh, untouched. Use all the propellant, they drop off. The third stage has three of those things, completely full of propellant at the staging. And you continue on. Third stage is using all the outboard ones. They drop off, and then fourth stage is completely full uh, when you've had the third stage complete. And what's that? Okay. Um, <laughs> with, with that design, if, if one of the engines had to be shut down uh, during launch uh, for technical problems, would you uh, switch the uh, which tanks you draw from? Would uh, no, that work? would be fixed. And what I want to show you is something very unusual as we go along. That these ten, these engines are virtually I say virtually because that thing's foolproof. Virtually failure free. And furthermore, uh, each one of those rocket segments, I'm going to show you, has at least seven engines underneath it. Let's say one of them is shut down. This, this particular vehicle, this configuration, and this is the one I'm presenting to NASA, a 15,000 pound version, has 73 engines underneath it. Oh, how could we afford 73 engines? But as I'll come to, these engines are uh, designed to be built industrial for somewhere between $400 and $2,600 per engine. Hundred. I've heard some NASA people say, what? Where's the word million in that? I didn't hear it. Back in, back in Washington, I don't know how they test microphones, they go, testing one billion, two billion, three billion. <laughs> so anyway, this is the way it really looks if you spread it. If you take this thing and unroll it, you're using uh, propellant from these outer two stage one tanks until they're empty, drops off from a quick disconnect. You've got the center three, and center five, uh, stages two to five. You start drawing on it. In fact, this is what we got there, stage two. They're now full fuel at the beginning. At the end, the, the stage two tanks are empty. They drop off, you got three of them full of propellant. The outer one's uh, completely empty, and then you go to stage four, completely full of propellant at the beginning. Okay, that's basically the simplicity of the architecture. Now, the, we've talked already a little bit about the engines. Pressure-fed engines are the most simple rocket engine you can possibly have. They have no gas generators. They have no high-speed turbines. They have no uh, high-power density pumps. Uh, they have no constantly mo uh, moving parts. In fact, they have no rotating parts whatsoever uh, if, you have, if you get rid of those gas generators and turbines. Uh, you have the simplicity of solid rocket motor, very advantageous yet the lightweight and the cooling capacity of liquid rockets. Theoretically, they should be very, very inexpensive. <clears throat> now, one thing that uh, you tend to have a problem if you try to have a pressure-fed rocket, especially if you have one that uses the same engines from the ground all the way up, is, this, is on a rocket engine, as these gases pass through the throat and start expanding and gaining velocity in the diversion section of the nozzle, they expand, this expands, in fact, they, it tends to overexpand, creating the vacuum, and that actually pulls the performance way down and can collapse the engine. There's a lot of problems with that, and that's one of the reasons they go to higher pressure engines. And the, the uh, solution is a variable exit ratio rocket engine, but uh, NASA has worked a long time and have never really come up with a, a good solution to that. There's always problems with it. Um, and we've come up with a solution which, uh, this particular slide was an invention description that I gave to Rockwell International, um, but it turns out that uh, people have looked at this possibility. This is basically the engine envelope design that seven of these engines would go under each one of those rockets you saw. By the way, that, that picture I showed you, let's get some perspective, I don't have to go back to it, um, had a picture of a rocket, 
that's designed to carry about 15,000 pounds. That was about, each one of those rockets were about eight feet in diameter. This is not huge. and stand about 40 feet tall. These are easy to handle uh, uh, rockets. They carry 15,000 pounds of cargo. That's what the numbers come out to be. That eight feet, including all the modules, or just per module? This one? Eight feet per module. Per module? Eight feet per module. The whole vehicle is about 25 feet in diameter, about 40 feet high. But each one of those individual modules is really easily handleable. Would this be stacked at the pad or? or uh Stacked uh, not at the pad, but uh, but in a in a high bay near the pad, rolled out. Uh, the Russians like to roll theirs out uh, All the vertical. We like to roll out ours horizontal. I visualize that the best it turns out to be horizontal from my point of view and the trade studies I've done. Uh, no stacking at the pad. The pad is not is no substitute for a factory. Uh, to me, a rocket should come out as a complete, ready to go item. What happens with those high pressure tanks if you have something like a, a bird strike at, uh, during the first few seconds of flight? Well, let's say the, the Atlas would be much more vulnerable to something like that with a very thin skin. Actually, the, the, uh, uh, probably less so than, than one of the lower pressure tanks would be. Uh, when the Atlas people were building, were saying, we're going to build this thing out of stainless steel, it's this thin. People look samples of this and say, come on, give us a break. And so what they did was they put, made a little barrel arrangement and they pumped it full of about 15 PSI of pressure. And they put a big hammer there and they said, put a sign down below, it says, hit me. So people would come with this hammer and tap it, tap, 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 tap. And the executive would come out and say, no, 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 really hit it. Wham! And that hammer just bounced off that thing. The stiffness and the resilience you get from, from having the high pressure behind it uh, made it made it so what was what should have been soft it would be crunched if it didn't have something behind it with all that gas pressure behind it, it's pretty good. So in fact you have to have such uh, if you're going to build tanks inexpensively that don't require very much inspection, you also have to build a lot more safety margin in it than you would in the aerospace well, product. At 500 so pounds, if it, it got a puncher, it wouldn't stay a puncher. It would, it would, oh, it would blow, yes. It would blow. But it would, a bird wouldn't do it. I mean, they build canopies, which are fairly thin, to take a bird strike at uh, 500 knots or 400 knots or so. Uh, this thing, first of all, a bird would never be able to come inward at the tank itself because you have a fairing above it. Uh, but. Oh, all the seven will have a fairing over it? Well, let's see. Let me, let me find that picture again. There is a fairing above it. You see this? You got this protective fairing here. Oh. This actually has a hemispherical tank above it. The fairing uh, is. Uh, no, actually, it has the pressurizing uh, fluids inside it. Helium, or how are they pressurizing? Uh, you can use uh, helium, is, is not. Uh, actually, what I want to use is uh, use decom decomposed. Uh, hydrazine to pressurize the fuel tank, but that comes out too hot. But I want to be able to use liquid helium to pressurize the oxidizer tank, that comes out too cold. But with a proper heat exchanger between them, uh, you can get a medium uh, temperature in between and you can end up with hot helium uh, that's very efficient pressurization for the LOX tank and hydrazine at a, much, at a reasonably cooler temperature for the fuel tank. But, that's a, but these tanks would be pressurized to 500 PSI, yes. If you pierce them with a, now a high-powered rifle would pierce them and make a real mess. Yes. Uh, of course it would make a mess of the space shuttle if one of them pierced the hydrogen tank too. Uh, but the bird won't go through that. This, these, if you're talking about a design for 500 PSI, well, a bird's not going to go through. The aren't are pressurized uh, like that. Yeah, they're low pressure. But uh, it, still the thickness is something that you're not going to be able to drill through this thing very easily. Certainly not with a bird. Maybe if Rodan hit it, certainly would. Well, I know, like, Eagles have almost brought down B-52s. Yes. And uh, Geese have brought down a, a B-1. Right. And it's that, you know, oh, you, but it hits vulnerable parts. You have a, the, the turbine of a jet engine spinning at uh, 12, 13,000 RPM, and a duck goes through that. You've got a real mess. Especially those blades are fairly fragile. This, the tanks are pretty hefty and robust at 500 PSI. I can throw a side light on that just because we have listened to Bergen even more. They take frozen chicken, I've yeah. seen that, five pounds, and they shoot at the can yeah. of canopy yeah. with flexes. This is the same principle on this one now. The flexor absorbs the, the impact without actually damaging the structure itself. Yeah, I've, I've watched the, uh, the shots of that. And the one where, the big one talked about the B1, the, the goose, just happened to hit a place where it took out a hydraulic line. 
and the hydraulic lines are flexible, so it just took it out. In fact, as you'll see, the design I have is it doesn't really have vulnerabilities built into it. It's, it's built more like an A10 than it is a B52, I guess. <laughs> this, oh, those, oh, uh, we haven't gone over that first slide yet. This is the altitude compensating nozzle that I've designed. That's quite simple. Uh, all you do is take a high, a, a high altitude nozzle, that in this case, 24 to 1 expansion ratio, which is designed to fit on this particular rocket, seven under each one of the eight foot segments. And you fill in part of it with some sort of an ablated material. This ablated material is something that burns off fairly evenly over a two minute period. And so when you lift off, you've got the expansion ratio of about 4.1 to 1 for the, between the throat area and here, optimum for sea level. As it burns off, it turns out you follow that optimum curve pretty much up to about 100,000 feet. And once you reach the, uh, the optimum expansion of 24 to 1. And so you've got a, a rocket that is very efficient. And for every pound of ablating material, that you have here, you get about 15 or 16 pounds of additional thrust at sea level. So it's a good trade-off, a fairly simple way. Well, uh, NASA and the Air Force looks at this, and they say, well, that's really great, but you really can't move that engine. You can't steer with it. You're not designed to. It's not designed to, yes. If you try to move that thing, it's constantly changing mass. Well, you've got a real engineering nightmare. So but anyway, we, this, is, this is the one. We would put this under five of the segments times seven engines, 35 of this kind of engines, altitude compensating. And then the outer, the first stage ones would put 19 of these. If you put, put one slide right over the other, actually, put the other one. They're the same thing except, the, except for the divergent section of the nozzle. And others use common injectors, same injector, same thrust, same, same throat, same everything except for the divergent nozzle. And have 38 of these under the two, first stage segments. Now we're talking about 73 engines under this entire vehicle. That's mass production when you're launching one at a time. But you can get away with it if you can bring the cost of those engines down to somewhere between $400 and $2,600 per copy. Okay. And we've looked at other processes besides making engines out of stainless steel, which isn't really bad, uh, and using locks as a coolant, all in the name of economy. We've also uh, looked into making the main engines out of uh, composite material, which can be very inexpensive. Uh, this is an example of a, a Delta second state engine, which is entirely composite. It's a liquid engine that's composite. People say, you can't make an engine out of composite material. Yes, you can. You'll have just a little bit of erosion of the throat. You'll have some, some ablation inside. And actually, you can enhance the cooling. And especially if you're going to use locks, which is very, very cold, <coughs> When you use locks of the coolant, the problem is no longer having enough fluid to cool down the rocket engine because it's, you have about 2.26 times as much locks as you have fuel. And locks is already much colder. It has a lot more heat capacity than the fuel does. And you've got a much greater range. You can increase its temperature. So you've got a great amount here. What you really have a problem is limiting the amount of cooling you get from that locks. And since uh, composite material is a better insulator, doesn't transmit the, the heat as fast as metal, the combination of a composite shell of an engine cooled with, uh, with liquid oxygen on the outside of it, not, not necessarily in uh, tubes all the way around it, but uh, uh, some locks in contact nearby pass will, can end up making a very inexpensive engine possibility. That's one of the industrial techniques we were looking to uh, making the engines very inexpensive. Now we're going to talk about the second cost driver on rockets for design would be the steering system. And we propose to do something very unusual. We propose not to move the engines at all as we steer this thing. Normal rockets are steered by gimbling engines up and down six or seven degrees in pitch and yaw. And in so doing, change the thrust vector and therefore steer. If we can get, get rid of that kind of a concept, have these engines so they don't move, we've got a major simplification and cost savings, a major savings in weight, and eliminating a lot of failure modes. It also eliminates the particular problem we have of trying to steer these altitude compensating nozzles, which would be changing mass. So here's how we're, we're proposed to do it. We propose merely to take these engines and vary the thrust in them. We have 73 of them to begin with. That can be done. Well, it turns out that's not an easy thing to do on a normal rocket engine because you've got those turbo pumps. 
that's where you have a lot of momentum. You can't run those things up, up and down and thrust any significant amount of thrust in, in a matter of a few milliseconds. But with pressure-fed engines, with fast-acting valves, you can get this thrust to move up quite a bit in a matter of 10 to 100 milliseconds. And if you can do that, especially when, as you'll see the engine layout, you can get significant uh, control on this rocket. Okay, let's say the first stage. And here's how we do it. We want to yaw over this way. We need to send these, either increase the thrust in these engines. Well, actually, we want to run them at 100%. So in reality, we do the virtual same thing of lowering the thrust on these two engines. This thing will yaw over this direction. If we want to roll this thing, we've got, a, we've got eight engines that are off axis, off on the roll axis. If we want to roll this way, we can either increase this thrust, that may not be practical, but we can decrease this thrust. There'll be a little bit of mismatch on the yaw direction, but that can be compensated uh, by steering other rocket engines. It seems very complex, and a lot of people have been concerned about that, but really this is exactly the sort of thing that your desktop computer is designed to do efficiently. This is merely a lookup table problem. Okay, uh, let's go on to the next slide then. Here's what we have when we're on second stage. We've eliminated a couple of those. We still have pitch, yaw, and roll control. We go on to third stage. We still have pitch, yaw, and roll control. In fact, we, have, we don't really need to use these for roll control in the middle. And we go on to fourth stage. Again, with seven engines, we still have pitch, yaw, and roll control. It all works out very nice. But suppose we have an engine failure. Now we're going to go ahead and say why this engine virtually cannot fail. This is the valve arrangement for uh, fuel or oxidizer, one or the other that we plan to use. Just have eight valves in parallel. These are digital valves. This is, this is not, no longer getting away with the complexity of a proportional valve where we want 80%, we move this valve up to an 80% mark. We want 90% and we open up a little bit more. No, all we do is we uh, open and close a combination of, of these eight valves. And since they're in parallel, it turns out this is not linear. So we want to actually put a, a restrictor or pilot orifice on one of these so that if valve number eight alone is open, we're running about 50% thrust. Uh, the others, once we have valve number seven open, uh, we're well up in there, close to 90% thrust. But that gives us enough control over the rocket. In fact, let's look at how we have if we have two of them. Now, why can't this thing fail? Let's take some, one of the reasonable failure modes of, of valves. Remember, of course, this is the only, these are the only moving parts on these engines. And I've looked through all the failure modes of all the American rocket failures that have gone to space in, since the 1960s, and I have not found a, a failure mode where an engine thrust uh, chamber, which is not a moving part, has failed. It's always been in the moving parts area. Uh, a valve can fail by failing open, it can fail by sticking closed, or it can burst. As far as burst, you can build them robust enough so they virtually can't burst if you have the whole thing housed. So let's say that, that valve number six sticks open. All you do is leave valve number, uh, the other, it's companion valve, this is a fuel uh, locks valve. You leave the companion fuel valve open and you operate with the other valves, opening and closing to get you the, to get your control. Suppose uh, another one fails, it sticks, clo uh, this one sticks closed, this one sticks open. Well, you can actually pair them off. You can have a large numbers of valve failures, more than you can contemplate as even being reasonable before this thing uh, either fails 100% on or 100% off. And in fact, let's look at, at how much control we do have. That's a bar chart of how much control we have. As you can see with the uh, pilot valve and one valve open, we're about 88% thrust level. And so our real dynamic range, presuming we have, say, four failures in this thing, that causes not to be able to use this part in here, and not to be able to use this part in here, we still have a, a really good dynamic range, very close to optimal thrust, just with a limited number of valves. So, how does the pilot valve go? What's that? How does the pilot valve go? The pilot valve is is a valve just like the rest of them, except it has a restriction to it. As you notice, this thing is non-linear. We come on down and lower and lower. If we have the pilot valve as the same value as the others, we get down to about 82%. We put the restriction in there because what we want to do on this is we want all engines to become operating and operate at about 50% thrust, so it's not going to lift off. 
before we commit to flight. As soon as you have all, of, all of them going, then you start kicking in some of the other valves, building up thrust and lifting off. A simple way of doing it. And also probably the most uh, fail safe. <laughs> you know you have a good product before you let it go. Turns out the pressurizing system, I think we had some discussion on that one, is the most difficult uh, that there is. Uh, in the aerospace industry, and as you know, I, I made this slide for Rockwell International. They thought the best solution of all was to, was to pressurize both the fuel and the oxidizer tank with uh, uh, helium. And the best way of doing that, the most compact way, is use a mixture called tridyne, which is 78% helium, about 20% oxygen, and about 2.5% hydrogen. You think that's explosive hydrogen and oxygen together. But in the presence of, in those particular concentrations, in the presence of helium, even in high pressure, that's not explosive. It's uh, safe. However, you run this stuff through a um, catalyst bed. The hydrogen and oxygen combine, give you steam, heats it up, and this allows you to take this tridine gas and keep it stored at about 235 degrees below, which allows you to get three times as much gas mass in each volume. Uh, you can store it at fairly high pressure. And it brings down the uh, size of your pressure tank within reason. And officially, I'll go along with that, although I found that there's, a, to me, a better solution would be to use pure helium for the oxygen tank and, and heat it up. And use uh, the, the, uh, the decomposition products of hydrazine, which is primarily ammonia, well, it is entirely ammonia, nitrogen, and hydrogen. If you take 10 molecules of hydrazine, you'll end up with 11 molecules of hydrogen, six molecules of, of uh, uh, ammonia, and something like seven molecules of nitrogen. I'm not sure exactly what it is. I've got that down. It's in some of my papers. But those that come out very hot, those, all those are very lightweight uh, gases. And very interestingly, in fact, I have I haven't said this to this is a nice little group to, to announce this. I've looked into a very interesting but risky way of doing it. There's no real reason why you can't take the oxygen tank, pressurize it with helium to about, to about three or 400 PSI on the ground with a ground supply and use no more helium. After all, helium is $15 a pound. That's pretty expensive. There's a limited amount to it. And you have to use an awful lot of this to pressurize this, this tank. You use a lot less if you heat it, but you have still have to use an awful lot. Liquid hydrogen is much as expensive, but you'd never want to introduce liquid hydrogen into, a, into an oxygen tank. Or would you? If you've got this blanket of helium already, suppose you take the decomposing products of hydrazine, and you cool it off by injecting a, an amount, a, a, a moderate amount of liquid hydrogen onto this thing. So it comes out of, say, 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Mostly liquid hydrogen, or mostly gaseous hydrogen, which is the lightest, far lighter than helium. Would that explode? Well, you've got this helium at first, and this thing is start, going to start layer caking. The heaviest thing that comes out of that is going to be nitrogen. The nitrogen is going to sink to the bottom. Nitrogen is inert. The helium will start moving up. The next thing above the nitrogen will be a layer of ammonia. If you've got nitrogen between ammonia and oxygen, if there's any oxygen that turns to a gas, it'll be below the nitrogen or mixing with it. You've got these layers. There's no reason that I can see that you can't use uh, liquid hydrogen in both as a, as a pressurizing gas in both the fuel tank and the oxidizer tank, if you've really got guts. I'm mentioning this because I would never say this at NASA headquarters. You know what they do to me? Out the door. <laughs> I'd be gone. You, but it's intriguing. You, you, you think the shock waves during the ignition and, and the takeoff would want to mix so that the boundary layers would disappear? Well, it, actually, the time when it disappears is uh, when you stage this thing. Right. When this thing falls off, now suddenly it's going to be, be a mixing of the gases. But now, if you don't want these tanks to hit the ground, what do you do? Put a spark plug inside this thing, and 30 or 40 seconds after separation, bang! <laughs> it's, it's an interesting thing. Maybe a sidelight. But however, the point is that if you try to use things to pressurize the oxygen tank like gaseous oxygen, heat gaseous oxygen like they do in the space shuttle tank, and try to pump it up to uh, 500 PSI in this tank, you're going to have more than a ton of oxygen left in that tank as a gas. 
each one of those tanks, that's a pretty high penalty. If you use hydrogen, you're talking about 115 pounds worth. A lot less. Hot hydrogen, particularly. Uh, quite a bit of difference. If you use helium, it's going to be uh, perhaps 400 pounds. $15 a pound, that's pretty expensive. That, that would be the most expensive part of the rocket. These are just interesting side lights. But and basically, the, uh, the pressurization system pretty, pretty routine. I should pull that slide out. What about a diaphragm between the, uh, the fuel or oxidizer and the pressure? Something yeah, you can have an insulating diaphragm. Maybe not necessarily a diaphragm. Gets kind of complex. Remember, I'm always looking for simplicity. Oh, that I believe that was slide yeah. down the same. Things that can take the uh, liquid oxygen temperatures and still be flexible are kind of hard to find, especially things that are then also compatible with blocks at the same time. So in actuality, the, the real, uh, any early flights would be, the proposed would use helium. But eventually, if you're talking about uh, setting up an expensive satellite for a university or for NASA or something like that, you'd want to use oxygen. But the interesting thing about uh, when I mentioned hydrogen on this thing, was the volume you need of oxygen, of hydrogen or helium, this is about the same. Hydrogen is bulkier than helium, but the amount you need fits in the same volume. And so you could virtually use the same tank, uh, instead of using helium one time, you experiment by putting hydrogen in and flying one. And you do this if you had a very inexpensive payload. And in fact, some of the payloads I've, I've bought, what would you use this rocket for? To put up a high price satellite? Not necessarily. You should probably have a balance between the value of the satellite and the value of the cargo. And we're, we're talking about the National Space Society who wants to get people into space. People cannot be shrunken like electronics. People are mass-intensive beings. We may only weigh a couple hundred pounds at most. Some of us violate that particular rule. <laughs> but uh, uh, we consume a lot of material. TV dinners, we take them up on the space shuttle, are $15,000 to $20,000 each just for the delivery. And I'm looking for some sort of vehicle, and I'm presenting this to NASA, to solve their overriding problem of how do you send up things that are needed, that are vital in space, that are cheap on Earth, but because of the delivery costs are prohibitively expensive in space. This includes not only TV dinners and oxygen for astronauts, a propellant. You know, three out of every four pounds that the United States has ever sent up into space has been propellant or upper stages. So this is uh, there's a definitely a growth area in this. So anyway, uh, that that was the uh, the idea of using triodyne. Uh, it does lower the weight. Uh, it is somewhat more expensive, but at least a uh, pressurization system. Whether you take a really high risk approach that I think would be very interesting to try, or a medium risk approach like triodyne. Or, uh, or this would be a low risk approach, or medium risk like using hydrazine and a heat exchanger and helium. Uh, it's this definitely a relatively simple and easy problem to solve. And the masses are, are fairly reasonable if you use, if you do use uh, light gas in the oxidizer tank. Yes, Yes, but uh, these, and you don't want to fly through a lightning storm with, with that. However, as I say, the interesting part was that even as, as dangerous as this sounds, it is possible to be perfectly safe. Myself, I, I don't like to be anywhere near rockets that have fuel and oxidizer on the same time. I think the most terrified I've ever been on a rocket was we went up to the upper level on Titan one time, and we were going to calibrate the uh, accelerometers. Well, that sounds pretty easy, but here's all you do. You take these strings and move them about three inches from the Titan. Oh, that's easy. And then we're going to rock this thing back and forth. Full of propellant. Okay, that seems easy. I mean, what, it's only that far from the strings. But when you start rocking this thing and you're on, you're on 100 feet in the air and you finally get this thing moving only three feet, you stand back and this thing looks like it's about to topple over. <laughs> so I don't like being uh, taking any risks myself. Uh, however, uh, there are a lot of things that are inherently dangerous within the space shuttle. They do have fuel-rich uh, fuel gases and, uh, and oxidizer-rich gases coming together in a common uh, area that are separated only by a purge of helium. There are ways of managing things that sound very, very risky, and certainly NASA is not very risk-oriented, uh, and yet that's the design they have in the space shuttle lean engines. And it works, it doesn't matter of failure, but they do know one thing, if that, hydrogen pur if that helium purge ever failed, it would definitely explode.
So stiff structures. We've somewhat covered this. Um, any rocket operating at 500 psi is very stiff. You take an ordinary uh, Coca-Cola can, Pepsi Cola, if that's what you like. Shake it up. You can stand on it, and, and it's pretty stiff. It's not going to buckle very much, just from the internal pressure. It's not the liquid in there. It's the carbonated pressure that keeps it from buckling. You can stand on it on edge. Uh, it's pretty thin aluminum, so if you got a grit on your shoe, you might pierce it and have a real mess. But that's why I didn't bring a can in to demonstrate today. However, it does work. You can experiment. I do recommend you do it outside and with some old clothes. But I tried it. It works. However, you take an empty can with nothing and no internal pressure, and you step on it and it crushes. A guy like myself, I can crush him in one step without, without no jumping, just stand on him, down they go. So this pressure actually stiffens the whole thing. And a Coca-Cola can has no internal structure. And a Coca-Cola can is basically how I envision this tank to be. <clears throat> okay. And we've always also talked about the balloon tanks. That's uh, uh, exactly what the Atlas has been. And we, at first we looked at using stainless steel because that's what the Atlas did. But there's higher strength steels that, are, that, are, that uh, can cut down the weight and, and make this thing much simpler, like the high nickel steels, D686. Um, I always thought composites would be a very expensive thing. But as I looked into this, uh, the process is what determines how expensive. Steel is not expensive. Composites, the material is not expensive. But normally, as you make a composite engine or cell, laying down ply after ply by hand, that's a very expensive part when you finish it. But if you can get a tank which is round continuously off of a spindle, that can be a very inexpensive tank. And I've work, worked with uh, EDO Car Corporation in Salt Lake City, Fiber Science Division, and they've shown processes that would allow you to make these tanks for around $7 per tank pound. If we use carbon fiber, which is a, a very low density, very high strength, it'd be about $13 a pound. And it would actually be more than we need for the vehicle size we showed. would carry more than 15,000 pounds of cargo. Uh, didn't really like carbon fibers, though, because it requires some careful handling. And it is more expensive and less cost effective, even though S-glass is not as strong per pound as it's a medium density. Uh, it's, it's much cheaper to fabricate, it's much more resilient, and it fits our needs very well. If we pay $7.10 a pound for propellant tanks, then we're right on track. Which, by the way, I usually wait about this time before mentioning how much I have my target of bringing the cost of space transportation is. We haven't talked numbers yet. It's $5,000 a pound on a Delta and Atlas or Titan. $10,000 on, on a space shuttle. $35,000 on a Scout. These costs potentially could drop as low as $25 a pound in such a vehicle. That's not price, it's cost. Price means if we do it commercially, we'll have a pretty good markup. <laughs> but with these sort of uh, processes, with the higher rate of production by having large numbers of clusters, with all these things factored in, uh, with the sort of demand you'd expect from prices below 500, anything below $500 a pound, you start to come into uh, much higher rates of production. Then at that rate, after a little experience, uh, there's no reason why this thing shouldn't be $200 a pound, $100 a pound, and theoretically as low as $22 a pound. That's really low. And what I've worked on is trying to find, you know, is there any way of making this particular vehicle less expensive? And this is what has finally evolved from every effort I've made to try to come up with the lowest potential cost per pound for an expendable launch vehicle. And I've not found any way of making a non-expendable or reusable vehicle uh, work better. By the way, this thing is also very, uh, some people say, well, your mass budget's not really off. This is going to weigh more than you think. If you add 1,000 pounds to each one of these seven segments, the center one and all these round, then the payload will be less by about 1,257 pounds. It's not sensitive, very sensitive, to increases in weight. So if I've made mistakes on my mass budget, and it's not really a big showstopper disaster, what happens if SSTO misses their, their mass budget by 1%? They've got negative margins to get to orbit. 
if I miss it by 10%, I can still, still have a very cost-effective system. And just quickly through on performance charts, I ran this, uh, uh, modeled the whole thing, ran it on a computer, and this is the, uh, the G loads we get, and it's, uh, kind of, I've come up with some redesigns because I didn't really want to have third stage go beyond 3G, so we'll have a blowdown system in that. That is, it'll be running at 500 PSI, and when it reaches near the end, it'll have less pressure in it, which will give a little bit more performance, and it'll kind of level off at that. Uh, uh, and also put a 4G limit on the fourth stage. The fourth stage turns out that you can make the tank thinner and carry more cargo and operate at lower pressure, and it's cost effective. Now, if you're making a tank out of metal, it's awful hard to change gauges to make it, the fourth tank a little bit custom, customized. But if you're wrapping composite materials on an inflatable manual type thing, all you do is you give it fewer revolutions on this thing. It really works out fairly nice. And we were looking to operate this thing, instead of at 500 PSI, we operated at 300, 300 PSI and run the burn time out closer to 500 seconds. And uh, we end up having uh, much more uh, pay payload capability in space. Okay. And uh, just downrange versus uh, altitude. Uh, this is something NASA always wants to see what's our max Q. Uh, we're lifting off uh, the design we have with the 73 engines, and some people might criticize that and might want to have less power. That's pretty powerful. It's lifting it very close to two Gs on liftoff. Uh, at 33 seconds, you have stage one uh, drops off and your dynamic pressure goes to about 720 PSI. The uh, space shuttle is designed to about 619 to 720. Uh, it depends on the, the lower numbers for the Columbia and the higher numbers for the later ones. Uh, that's a reasonable dynamic pressure, but that can be shaped down very easily if you want, if, if you want to have a, a vehicle that doesn't have that much dynamic pressure, then you can take a few inches off the first stage. Minor, uh, minor losses in performance. Thrust versus time. The reason the thrust isn't constant in the first and second stage is because you're getting more and more efficient with your thrust as you go higher and higher in altitude, especially with the altitude compensating nozzles that I have. And mass versus time. Velocity versus time. NASA loves these charts. So I don't think they have a whole lot of need in here. And uh, Altitude versus time. This is all designed to, by the way, this, this is meant to be, uh, these were trajectories that I shaped on my model to a 100 nautical mile target. Because what I want to do is, I try to define things as being 15,000 pound capacity to lower the orbit and reduce everything to uh, dollars per pound. That means the propellant, payload, the cost of the manufactured rocket, uh, everything into a, some sort of a common denominator. And I would rather use a generic low Earth orbit, which to me means an ideal velocity change, including losses in gravity and drag, uh, an ideal velocity change of 30,000 feet per second. In this case, this, is, uh, this will be a launch from a place like Hawaii, 19 degrees uh, north latitude, due east, 100 nautical mile orbit, 15,000 pound uh, payload capacity, 100 nautical miles up. That was just what I shaped it for. Just for evaluation, NASA loves to see these things. Otherwise, they didn't take the problem all the way through. And that's the that's the mass budget we have on it. Uh, that was the one I presented in uh, February at the uh, 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 California Space Development Conference. Uh, no changes on that. However, as uh, we've since looked at a lot of things, and by the arrangement of our pressure tanks, since since pressure tanks also are stiff balloon tanks. If we put the pressure tanks in the nose and have the internal pressure help keep the fairing stiff itself, this fairing can be much less, less uh, weighty. Our forward fairing area would, would be much less weighty. You can't see this close up. Forward skirt, the nose. This would be a lot less, and we're also looking a lot less on the inner tank area, which is significant. But anyway. Uh, this particular version came out to be 13,862 pounds uh, capability in orbit. We were targeting uh, 15,000 pounds. We're back up to being able to achieve that by using uh, by the use of composite tanks and by uh, trimming down the design weight of the nose and the inner tank. 
how does this thing separate? We, we propose also, if we're going to go simplistic, might as well go all the way. In fact, it's kind of folly to have a complex uh, system and a simple system kind of side by side. So we also want to have a very simplistic uh, separation system. And we're looking just to having some, some tension members that will uh, pull off all the inner stages. And when that particular stage runs out of propellant and its engine shut down, it will fall away and these same tension members will then go into compression and be like a pole vault and kind of push this thing away as it falls away. And the only thing that's holding this thing together is the fact that stage one is always giving a net uh, pull on the other five stages. Stage two, even when stage one is operating, is always giving a net pull on stage three and four. Stage three is always giving a net push on stage four uh, until such time as those said stages stop. Uh, the engine stop working. And then they should just fall away and actually fall off and actually be pushed away by these tension members. We have some drawings of how that would work. It's not distinctly different from uh, the way the uh, solid rocket motors fall away from the delta. A, a very simple way of dropping things off. Okay, no pyrotechnics, no separation motors. The fuel and locks lines must be disconnected, but quick disconnects as they have on the Atmos are fairly common. It's not the technology of that, and they're not very, very complex valves either. And uh, we found that there is adequate clearances and all this. Okay. Now we're talking about for NASA, when I gave this presentation, we're talking about something that's 40 feet tall from here to here, and the payload is extra. Nice, small, short vehicle. That really makes it nice if, you, if you're talking about facilities. The bigger your launch facilities are, the more expensive they get. If you've got something that can be handled inside a high bay that's 40 to 60 feet high, that's really great. If you start talking about a 300 foot high bay, that's a lot more capital. Uh, but that's for 15,000 pound uh, cargo capability. It turns out that with pressure fed engines, you've got a limit on the upside, how much bigger you can make it. But downscaling becomes more and more efficient. Here's a case, dropping this thing down to about 20 feet high from here to here plus the payload. That would carry about 1,500 pounds, and the engines would operate at a lower pressure, the tanks would be lower pressure, and it would all be simpler to manufacture. Of course, that's the area I'm interested in, small satellites. Uh, anyway, the, it's, I think we've probably covered most of the rest of the slides. Let me take a quick look see what we do have left. Uh, perhaps. Uh, yeah, it's starting there, yeah. yeah. Uh, this is where we start hammering the message, you're ready to put the hook, and so forth. Basically, what I'm proposing is not really new. Everything that I propose is, has been done before, except I haven't seen any cases of rockets being controlled by thrust differential. I found airplanes have done it. For example, a DC-10 has a rear engine failure and the pilot in a matter of a few seconds has to learn to be able to control this thing in yaw and pitch just by how much thrust he puts to the two engines that are remaining. It's amazing how quickly they, they learn how to do that. I, can, I can't visualize that as being a survival aircraft, but they made it happen. So if you do it on an aircraft in which when you push that throttle to the metal and it finally does something, has up to an eight second delay. Imagine what you can do if you have pressure fed engines which have quite fast response time. By the way, I'm not going to mention too much about the valve that I use on my control because uh, I think we've got this pat patentable situation there, but it has one moving part in it. And when it moves, uh, it has a way of sensing whether, which state it is, too, so you don't have any ambiguity what state it is. This thing will just be open or closed, uh, very fast acting, completely sealed. Nothing, no. No seals that require that require something to come out of it. Entirely closed valve. Electrical, pneumatic, or hydraulic? Electrical. You know, through magnetic. You so, know. Uh, a side threader valve, when it, when a tank separates, it automatically, that one would shut, realize the pressure uh, off and shut down also. Well, a quick disconnect valve uh, between the stages, uh, I would have a, that would be a double poppet with a, a sleeve that would hold them together. And as this thing starts pulling apart, both poppets will be pulled. And if you have pressure on both ends, which you do, uh, they will also fully, sell, fully seal this thing. 
and then when the sleeve falls off, it's, uh, you've got two poppets uh, fully sealed with the stem sticking out, and that's all you've got sticking out, and, and, and then the pressure itself will prevent it. How big it. a diameter line are we talking about? Six inches more? Uh, on the first stage, which is the biggest, remember you're supplying the propeller to the whole vehicle for uh, only 33 seconds you're depleting the tanks. That's a 13 inch line, that's the biggest one. After that, they get down to six to four inches. Individually? Yes. Yeah. The, the disconnects. Talking about, yes. You're talking about the main vehicle. Right, the main vehicle valve. Uh, but remember, we're talking about uh, these engines. 73 engines times 16 valves per engine, all identical. That's 1,168 valves. And we plan to use the same valves for controlling the pressurization system also. Stainless steel plumbing or? Uh, stainless steel would probably be, be um, uh, more expensive. It might, it might have to be for the LOX compatibility. And my feeling is that it's better to pay a little bit more on these valves, for example, to make them stainless, and make them say out of stainless steel so you can make them LOX compatible uh, than, than it would be to try to have one material for one type of valve and one for another. So you're saying that also they couldn't upsize or upscale this, they could downscale it fairly easily. The reason you have a problem on upscaling this thing, making it so it'll carry 100,000 pounds, for example, is just the limitation on pressure-fed engines. Uh, as you make the stack of propellant taller and taller, each square foot of propulsion underneath has to lift more weight. And therefore you have to have more, uh, more pressure within the engine. So there's some limitations on the upside, but the downside is very nice. And in fact, as far as I'm concerned, why can't we have a space ferry nation where all we can do is, if we had one vehicle, and it cost $22 a pound to get things up, up to space, and it only carried 7,500 pounds or 15,000 pounds of, of something, do you think you could build a good space infrastructure? I would say that if you had something that could carry 150,000 pounds of a crack, but it costs Five thousand dollars a pound, you'd have a hard time getting to Mars on that, yeah. because you'd have an economic, not a technical barrier. Uh, if you have a system that's very low cost, the real barrier to getting to Mars, which is not technical, it's economic, is finally surmounted. Uh, anyway, did nothing new. The, the Germans made six thousand five hundred and seventy-two V twos, mostly in the closing six months of World War II, they were producing the uh, rockets at about uh, 30 per day. They were in mass production of rockets. Rockets still have to be custom built. That was 19, that was 50, almost 50 years ago. They launched them off the highways. That's right, they launched them off the highways. Well, you know, I was, I guess I didn't mention too much about the background. Besides, uh, you know, the, the place that I saw all these uh, Russian rockets being launched, I, I worked in these satellites that observed uh, uh, rocket launches from space. It was overseas. I lived in Australia, and we watched these things in real time. But well, we also watched Scud launchings. That was classified until such time as the Gulf War. And suddenly they they said, "Yeah, we're, that's where we're seeing Scud launches." Scud barely compete with a V2. Scud is a V2, basically. It's a it's a granddaughter of the V2. It's all the all the Scud really is. Well, it was interesting. These Scuds were being I was not there during the uh, the Gulf War, but I was there during the Iran Iraq War. I watched hundreds of these things plummet uh, uh, Tehran and, and Baghdad. And these things, a fairly complex rocket, would be rolled out, erected very carefully because they were launching these things very close to the border, within artillery range of the other side, firing these things off and getting the heck out of there. And the penalty for being slow or not stealthy or careless in the middle of the night, you couldn't get lights and stuff going. And do this very, very quietly, quickly, and efficiently. Was being alongside of an airstrike. Scott were hyperbolic too. Yeah, that somewhat simplifies it, but no, it also I makes mean, it very makes dangerous. It a lot more dangerous. Yeah, yeah. you get a bullet hole right. in, in a tank like that. That's right. That's a soft target. You don't want to be around those things, so you've got to do it quickly. And they do it with a squad. They don't have a whole. They don't have an army of people around there. And so this squad of conscripts from villages in Iran, in Iraq, and Afghanistan that have fired virtually thousands of Scud combat launches. Yeah, I always thought it was funny. Is. They were worried about poison gas coming down. They were shooting yeah. Patriots in. And here they hit a, a full tank of, of, of hyperdolic fuel. They are worried about poison well, gas. Well, an empty tank of hyperdolic fuel, presumably, yes. You're right, yes. Hydrazine is bad. Uh, two parts, uh, 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 half a part per million is deadly. It's just 
pretty bad stuff. And it's heavier than air, so it gets done. You're right. But the, the question I had was, wait, if a squad can get a scud off in a couple hours, why does it take 14,000 workers at Cape Kennedy to get one launch a month off the way we do it? And the answer is, you really don't have to have that many people surrounding the rocket. And there are many ways of making it. You, you can make this thing so you can launch it like a scud. OK, that's that. Other people say, we've got, why do we need to fix it? We have a great infrastructure, particularly our friends from General Dynamics who still want to sell atlases. Our friends from Mark Marietta who still want to sell Titans. And our friends from McDonald Douglas who want to sell Deltas. But this is the sales figures of the number of space launches we've had since 1958. That's not a growth industry. We've actually come down. The height was 1966. All the shockings, well, we're more efficient now. We, we've used miniaturization. We don't need as many satellites. It's not that we don't need it. That's not really true. It's so expensive, that's all we can afford. <laughs> this is the balance between what we want and what we can afford. It's gotten so very expensive. I maintain that space should be a growth industry. And I took this little quote from, uh, from uh, Danny DeVito's uh, movie. You know, the surest way to go broke, keep eating an increasing share of a shrinking market. And space is a shrinking market. My feeling is if we bring down the cost of uh, space transportation, that won't be true. If we can bring down the cost, a lot of industries that would like to be in space that just can't get there because of the astounding costs will be in business. The hurdles are all mostly in our mind. You know, there's no constitutional amendment that says rocket transportation to space has to cost $5,000 a pound. There's nothing there. Rockets in the do domain of subsized, low-volume aerospace organizations? It doesn't say that in the Constitution. Uh, we've tried other ways of lowering the cost, and it's turned out to be failure. The space shuttle was supposed to bring the cost of space transportation down to $100 a pound, and NASA was right when they said, if we bring it down to $100 a pound, we will really have access to space wide open. We can have space stations almost as an afterthought. As far as putting all the supplies to go for an exploration trip to Mars, do da, send 20 or 30 of them up, assemble it, and it's off. But when it costs $400 million per mission, you can't say, do da, we'll put 20 or 30 of these things together and send them off. Then it's too expensive. So uh, we've tried to make things cheaper. It's, it hasn't worked in the past. Therefore, a lot of people say, wait, all these smart people have tried this. It doesn't work. Therefore, it can't be done. I think we've shown it can be done. We've tried one program. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we've got other ones on the books. We have single stage door, but we have NAS. ALS. We have the ALS. OK, but isn't this way showing the only thing that's the Cirrus? I think just, well, I, I think you're talking about serious money being spent. They're spending serious money on those programs. In fact, uh, um, that's one of, the, one of the things I would look at is I've gone ahead and said that, go ahead, throw that over me, that it is possible to build a rocket that can take things to space at $22 a pound. But wait, how much is it going to cost to develop such a system? It's fairly simple. The whole idea, if you're going to build an inexpensive system, you should also have a low development cost uh, for, for building it. It's folly to spend 20 and 30 billion dollars to make a cheap space transportation program, isn't it? If you spend billions of dollars on something, you're going to have a very elegant thing that's not going to cost a small amount. It's going to be very expensive. At, at this cost, you wouldn't need NASA. You could have a company uh, develop it on their own and almost become, uh, if, if the paperwork and permits doesn't kill them. Yes, that's right. However, and good point. Why am I going to NASA headquarters? Why don't I go to a venture capital and say, let's build this thing and we'll just sell this stuff <laughs> off the shelf to NASA? I think Amrock tried that and got burned a little bit. The government has money to help you if you work along with them. It's true as far as I'm concerned. If the government gives you $3 or a private, com a private investor gives you $1, you're about equal in, in the value of what you can spend that on. Uh, but it's really nice to have the government on your side and eventually become a customer. The government has done a lot of times, has had somebody has gone out, privately developed something that seemed impossible, and as soon as they make it prove it's possible, the government then goes ahead and pays somebody else to build something just like you and wipe you out. So I think it's very, very important 
That was the right to, brother. Yes, that's right. It's probably very important to include the government in all phases of this, even though, yes, you're right, this is the sort of thing that can be handled by private capital. Okay, uh, so it should be a, a very inexpensive uh, development program. In fact, uh, my guess is that there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to build a rocket of this architecture that can send something to orbit, an 80 pound experimental package, just to prove you can do it for under a million dollars. To build a, um, a rocket capable of putting about a 1,500 pound payload into orbit for around 11 to 12 million dollars. And to build rockets like this, with a full infrastructure ready to launch them and fully run out, ready for flight, for around $50 million. Something that, that would carry 1,500, 15,000. Are, are these rockets at, are these one shot deals? Yes, extensively. In fact, uh, since, since at the very end, let's go on back and we'll look at the picture again. I want to talk about the, a little bit about reuse on it because I've already said to report to the other audience that that uh, reusability tends to really flounder people. We're not really ready for reusable rockets. Now, it's not economic, but that doesn't mean in 10 or 20 years it won't be. And there's good reasons why it isn't now, but there's also good reasons why in the future that will work. I don't want to wait 10 or 20 years before it's, uh, before reusability is a good way of doing it. Uh, and my feeling is such a rocket like the kind here would be economically viable for uh, 30 or 40 years that's not such a long period of time. The Atlas has been economically viable since 1958. So well, the Delta. They can recover the, uh, the, the materials at, at ocean drops without having to worry about uh, hazardous material like hydrazines and other stuff. So you, you can have almost anybody go out there and, and, uh, and recycle the, uh, the tank material. Yes, at least uh, avoid pollution in the environment. And also, uh, I'll talk a little bit about that, about what you can do to recover some of this. My feeling is that uh, when it does become viable, you should be able to, re to recycle anywhere from uh, 55 to 65 percent of the rocket. Should be able to recover it and reuse it. But that would not be economical this year, next year, the first five years of operation. But perhaps five to 10 years down the line, it would be. OK, so but the design philosophy I was looking at is Make it ultra simple, easy to fabricate, resilient with huge safety margins. Maximum commonality, a system of redundancy that can be eliminated, get rid of it. Especially if you uh, use innovation, not necessarily high technology. Use materials that are cheap and easy to work with, with processes that, that uh, are easy to work with. Bring out failure modes with flight operations. And remember, if we're talking about 73 operations, uh, on my 10th flight, I've tested 730 engines. I'm confident of those engines if they haven't been failing. If I go five flights in a row with no engine failure, I know I'm on the right track. Uh, and eventually, I'll have that thing down to where any failure mode that is possibly there has been discovered. OK. Um, <laughs> five parts and assemblies in large, large lots. This kind of lend the, 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 the architecture I have, lend yourself to that. Minimum documentation and instrumentation. Why do you have to know what the chamber pressure, the chamber temperature is? Once you've run out all the failure modes and you're confident of the engine, why do you have to have all that instrumentation? Why do you have to pay an engineer $50 an hour to go over, which is a very boring job anyway, to go over all these charts and look for an anomaly of some sort? So they can call a meeting of, of 20 people who are being paid $50 an hour, discuss it for four hours, and decide it's insignificant. And it's a ritual. It's, it's a ritual. Like they don't even know what it's, they're doing anymore. It's a ritual. You're right. Glad you. Uh, very astute. <laughs> well, I had an A and P uh, guy who used to do that with his car oil filter. He, uh, he cut open air aircraft uh, oil filters to inspect what's inside of it. So he was doing the same thing on his, his car. And I said, why? You know, if you find metal in it, or you can tear the engine apart and rebuild it, you're still going to drive the car until it wears out or it won't run anymore. And it, uh, whether you know it, all you've got now is fear in your head that it might break down on you sometimes. That's exactly right. <laughs> Precisely. Uh, very often, I've, I've worked uh, quite well, a while Well, if you're buying a car, you might want to do it. Oh, I mean, every time he changes oil, he take off, he has the canister type one and pull the filter cartridge out and he cut it open. Exactly, give it an autopsy. Yeah, just like you do for air airplanes. and, and uh, you know, I can see with an airplane where if, if the thing, you know, quick sounds like I don't know, I told him to put a ring on the canister one and I'm 
themselves enough, enough blood was raised that they felt sufficiently punished over this thing, which was nobody's fault, that they could go and say, yes, we've looked at everything, do exactly what you had on your recommendation. It was a long ritual, spent a lot of money. Um, Non-toxic propellants, I don't know. I like hydrogolics, uh, they are expensive, they're about $4 a pound as a combination for, for hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide. But uh, it's an environmental three mile island waiting to happen. Uh, you can use that in upper stages very well, but uh, as far as uh, uh, using it in huge amounts, the more you use of it, the sooner something's going to happen there. Excuse me, yes. what do you mean by a three mile island? Three mile island was a big nothing. People got scared, nothing happened. Yeah, well, okay, um, let's do it this way. Yeah, so you're Vandenberg Air Force Base, a Titan collapses on the pad and, uh, and, and dumps. Uh, 50 tons of hydrazine that then blows towards Lompoc. Let's say we're lucky nobody dies. They will never again launch a Titan from Vandenberg Air Force Base. That's what would happen. I tell you this is being true because Aerojet who makes the engines has... So is this, a, so is this, a, is this actually risky or is it something that's going to set up the us? The first time, The first time they have a huge spill of hydrazine, the environmentalists will come out the wall. It's uh, hydrazine is considered fairly safe to handle, and it's a really a good propellant because remember you take hydrazine and mix it with nitrogen tetroxide, and it burns spontaneously. There's no igniters needed. It's a very it's very dense. It's got good energy. It's got really good properties. Uh, you can store it for long periods of time at room temperature. Uh, but the more eventually over a long period of time something is going to happen, and it also requires extra safety. I would like to have a rocket that I'm not afraid to go near myself. If I'm, yeah. if I'm in this business, I want something. And I, I feel fairly confident you can have a pretty good bang out of kerosene locks. But once you get this thing filled with propellant, you're going to back away far enough that when it goes bang, you're going you're gonna to have the video cameras rolling and you're going to probably make money on the publicity of, the, of this explosion they sell at the NBC Nightly News much more than you would have for the TV dinners you're about to send to the space station. <laughs> Always turn a... This principle always turn a problem into a feature and always turn a defeat into victory if you don't. <laughs> and, so, and simplify launch operations. Uh, as it, there's no reason to have a huge army. My vision of this thing is that the rocket of that size, capable of carrying 15,000 pounds to low Earth orbit, should roll out of the factory in the morning down to the pad, uh, be serviced by a crew of 10 or 12 people. And by the end of the shift, it should be on its way to space. Would that have a common, without many fuel tanks, a common fuel point? Or would yes. you fill each one separately? Common fuel point from the ground. Use its probably existing manifold and feed manifold to fill it. That's right, yes, absolutely. I noticed that uh, when they were first coming up with the uh, new national law system, that Martin Marietta had uh, proposed one that was almost almost like yours, but it was five, I think, boosters around a much taller fourth stage. Yes. And, uh, Again, uh, if, my, if my configuration looks familiar, I haven't come up with anything really new. No, I'm, I'm just trying to put it together in a different way for always. Well, I, I thought that was a good idea. Martin yeah. Marietta has come up with some, some great ideas. Over Martin here. Marietta is, uh, is the most innovative of the space booster companies as far as I'm concerned. They're, they're Mars Direct program. Yes. And if, if this was used, they're talking about, I think, using a Delta or something for their Mars Direct. <laughs> if this was used, it would, and it's basically a Delta class, an Atlas class, it, it, yes. it would it cut the cost down considerably. Even you could develop it and, and still be cheaper than even their Delta launch ones. Yes. Uh, that's the point, is the development cost I'm looking for is, uh, is to build something capable of carrying a payload bigger than a Delta or an Atlas should cost to the whole development program between the cost of one Atlas or one Delta. So what's in between that? And if you're going to spend more than that on your development, you're going to end up with too much elegance and it probably won't cost what you wanted. Probably the size of the proportion of your overrun from that kind of a budget 
would be the proportion of how much more expensive it would be to get this thing to, to run in operations. I asked you operations as well. First, you put something together, you use it for a few years, then you go on, you learn from your mistakes, and you come up with your, your next design model. You can't design something that's going to be good 20 years from now, right from the drawing board. It's too hard. You design something for course day, use it for a couple of years, and you progress to your next design. That's the way it's always worked. That's, that's <laughs> the there's faith that's struck. I don't remember that the same stage and a half that lifted Sputnik 1 into orbit still sends every Russian cosmonaut into orbit on a rocket vehicle that has a reliability rate that is 30 or 40 times better than any American rocket is, and at a cost that's one seventh of any American rocket. And there's a case of something that was designed in the 1960s. And if you now analyze it, it's basically uh, yeah, but they didn't 20 V2s strung together into a, <laughs> a re retank it a little bit, but it's a simplicity way of simple way of doing it. And it's had a, it's had an economic life of 35 years, 1,500 models. And for that matter, so has a Delta, an Atlas, and a Titan have had design lives that although the, the American way is always to make it bigger and bigger and bigger. The Russians started off with big rockets in the first place and <laughs> stayed steady, didn't change it. They adapted their operations to their capabilities. We start off with small ones, put up small satellites, and finally worked our way up to where we finally reach the cap capacity on our, our Titan that's finally approaching a proton. And, in capacity, our Atlas uh, Centaur is finally reaching the uh, Vostok uh, capacity, and the Delta is finally reaching the uh, Cyclone capacity. Our Scout is never going to reach probably the capacity of their uh, um, Cosmos, but they we've been in constant change in ours, our program. They built it fairly simply, knew what they were doing early on, and they knew they had limitations. There were, I've been to Russia, and I'll tell you, they, they, it was know very clear. they are very engineering limited on their space program. As you look at these various things they have on exhibit, you think, oh, I've seen that before. They use that particular gizmo on, oh, example, the, 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 the moon return capsule on their Luna, what was it? Their sample return from the moon came back in 72 or so. That same capsule that returns samples from the moon is the capsule they use to return film on their, uh, their uh, high resolution image and reconnaissance satellite. They use the same thing over and over again. They, they have this, to me, this proves that they have a limited amount of engineering they have, but they, uh, they use, they make up for it by having long production runs, building things in large numbers, very low cost. They don't worry if they drop one on the ground or, or somebody steps on one. What was it? Interesting, another thing about the Soviet space program, uh, I mentioned that there was, the Russians lied. They didn't have one failure of the SL-4 out of 592 in the 11-year period. They had two. Well, when they had that failure, they didn't shut down their launch facilities. They didn't say, oh, have a big investigation. They didn't say, 18-month hiatus while we investigate this thing. And we've got we to get another spacecraft. We've got to bring it on in and take We've got one already in production, but it'll be ready in about 14 months, and it'll all come together, and, and we'll replace the satellite 18, 24, 36 months later. Now, six to 12 days is their standard for it. If they, have a, if they do have one of those occasional and rare failures, they replace it six to 12 days later. That's pretty impressive to me. Oh, I think we could have done the same thing with the shuttle. I mean, everybody knew what the problem was. Yes, but I'm, we had I'm to saying we put ourselves for a while, didn't we? Yeah. Well, uh, don't launch it in January. Yeah. Uh huh. Yes, that's their right. Own rules, mm -hmm. and uh, I think they launched because they had a, a State of the Union address that day, and it was already told all the teachers would be mentioned the State yeah. of the Union, so it better go up. Yes, there's a lot of truth to that. But however, this, you have still long, to, long periods of shutdown when a when a Delta fails or when a. Well, this fails. happened with the uh, with the Apollo One fire. Yes, Apollo One. But whether even if men are not involved and the space shuttle is not involved, if it's in an Atlas, Delta, or Titan, there's still a long shutdown when they won't let those things fly. 
However, if, if United parks a jet in the side of a mountain, someplace in Colorado or Wyoming or something like that, does United say, hold it, all jets grounded, we're not going to find out what happened here before we fly again. No, they don't. In fact, to me, the space delivery business should be something that eventually becomes a really and truly off the shelf. When NASA wants to buy a rocket, they say what they want, they say how they want it made, and they have people watch it as made. They, yeah. they dictate the care that goes into it, the uh, reliability, yeah. and all the, they, they go all the way through this. When they order a car from one of their executives, they just take it right off the line in Detroit. Now, occasionally, one of their executives does get stranded someplace. But they take it off the shelf as being the way to do it. Now, my feeling is eventually, delivering things to space should be a commercial endeavor. If NASA wants it, they do it just like Federal Express. It absolutely positively must be get there overnight. We give it to Ed Keith, and he'll send it up. And then NASA can start having their problems starting in orbit rather than on the ground. Right now, let's face it, most of NASA's budget is involved in how do we get from the ground to orbit at a reasonable price. And I'm having a hard time with it. So the executives tell the engineers how to do it. Mm -hmm. This is how it is in the military. Sure. They'll train you in a particular job, then you'll have an officer come in who's never been trained in that and tell you how to do it. That's right. And it can be done that way, but it's not necessarily the most cost-effective way of doing it. So what's happening with private industry? Private industry is, uh, is right now, is probably the, high, the fastest growing uh, segment of space. Uh, commercial space is growing at 20% a year. It's projected to continue that way for quite a while. My feeling is that if we get launch costs lower, it'll grow much faster. If the launch cost is still restricted to doing the same way on a Delta, Titan, and Atlas, or space shuttle, it'll eventually start leveling off, and, and it's not going to have a great growth. But um, yes, I, I think that this is a, more of a, a commercial endeavor, uh, as you see here, than it would be a government endeavor. But if you're ever going to start something like this, you've really got to have the government involved from the very beginning. So when you finally sell it, they are also among the first customers. You should never, I mean, we all, maybe we're throwing a few rocks at the government here. Maybe we should, maybe we should. I think we deserve it, true. Uh, but we shouldn't throw them off the team just because they've done things very high cost and have, oh, no. have done what we think maybe is the same way. They are, yes. I have no objection with my government is steady in space. Yes. I think it's good because at least it gives people on the news something to show about space and people realize space still exists. They can die <coughs> and with the Apollo project. Um, and but the thing is is that I I have heard that the government has really made it tough for 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 private industries to try to develop launch capabilities. Actually they have, yes. Is I don't think it's in. It's yeah, are they, are, are, have they given your company a hard time? No, you're looking at the whole company here right now. Right now, right now in fact, what, what do you need to have a company? You need three things. You need to have a product. I think you have a pretty good product here. Okay, well, you need capital. You don't have to have a lot of capital to be a company. It, it depends on. But the real critical thing you need is a customer. And that's what I need is to have uh, NASA as a customer, and that's why I'm going back to NASA headquarters in September to give this presentation uh, so that I can get them aboard as a customer and get some development going. Along with having NASA as a customer also comes something called credibility. Uh, Although my feeling is the way somebody gets credible is, and, the, and I've talked to the Air Force about this and they agree, build a rocket in your garage and launch something in orbit, doesn't matter what it is, as long as it's trackable. Then and only then will you have credibility as a launch vehicle maker. If you can't do that, you're not going to have credibility. You don't have to build a garage, but until you have something in orbit. I still have uh, find some of the uh, new launch makers like Conestoga and stuff incredible because they haven't done anything yet. Everything's been on the ground. They're doing a lot of, they've done a lot of motor tests and stuff like that. But this, as soon as somebody like Pegasus actually gets something into orbit, suddenly they're really in the game. So I have to have a customer first and then create credibility next. Um, well, you know, if you get something in orbit, mm -hmm. people, there are payloads, there are people with payloads that are begging to go. Yes, there, there are, but they, they're not with the app. Uh, there's a yeah, they're not going to give you money in advance. 
they can't pay you that much too. If, right. if, if I charge if I charge you five thousand dollars a pound, there's not going to be a very long line out there for people who want to go to orbit. If I charge five hundred dollars a pound, this is going to be a pretty long line. If I charge a hundred dollars a pound, uh, the line is even longer yet. And if I say, I'll tell you what, I'm developing this thing. I can't guarantee it's not going to blow up on the pad. You bring your payloads to me, and I'll send it up to you free because I'm going to go anyway on a test program. <laughs> I'll be have to be fighting them on. Right? Now, by the way, what you said about you don't object to the government spending money in space. Neither do I. I, I think that uh, the $15 billion of spending now is, is reasonable. Uh, it'd be nice if they spent more. That would be great. But what I object to is how little um, uh, benefits you get back out of it. To me, if you spent $15 billion on space, you would really be getting something if that $15 billion bought you a uh, the ability to get a, uh, somebody, uh, an exploration team to Mars in, inside a decade or so. Really had a space station within that budget. Had a much larger robotic uh, uh, exploration of the outer planets. Uh, an orbit around Pluto, something they're like, talking about a flyby of Pluto or JPL. Uh, it's not just amount of money, but how much do we get from each dollar? Well, and that's what I'm trying know, to do is to make it so that we can afford... The issue is not how much do we get from each dollar. It, the, as far as Washington is concerned, there's those who want to have a space program. There's those that don't want to have a space program. So, the, so they're too busy fighting amongst themselves among, uh, whether or not we're going to have a space program. And they're not concentrating on how do we have a good space program. Yes, this, exactly. company yeah. that, this country first has to have a commitment to space. Yes. Okay? And <coughs> And it has to say this commitment is going to be for the next 10 years. But you've got a congressman. And then yes. you can say, uh -huh. okay, well, this is what we should be doing with the money. And this is the best way of, you know, of using the money. But it's. But if, if you can get a system to where you could send enough propellant that you could go to Mars with hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide uh, <laughs> in 10 years, uh, and and you're going to build Galileo crafts, not for a billion and a half a piece, but you're going to start cranking a bunch of them out, and you're going to send them up, and you're going to send extra stages up there to meet them in orbit and, and push them on to Jupiter and other places in larger numbers, and it's not going to cost any more money. Then a lot of these congressmen who are standing in line and say, yeah, I like space, but one and a half billion dollars for a Galileo, and the antenna will unfold, we can't get high gain, high gain antenna to work, and therefore, we can't get pictures back. What we do is to take a week of picture, two weeks of picture. Ah, that's not going to work. Or they get a Hubble telescope, and, and it's barely better than a terrestrial telescope. It costs a billion and a half dollars, and a, and a uh, world-class terrestrial uh, telescope facility in, say, Mount Mauna Kea would be $80 million. They're going to say, we can examine space from the Earth. But if you could put up a telescope into orbit for less than a terrestrial scout telescope, uh, 40 million, 30 million, suddenly you're going to have a lot of applications that are going to go up there. Right now, we, the, the only... Mr. Hubble is not that it isn't a good idea. The problem was is that they were trying to design the perfect space telescope their first time out. Yes. They didn't design one and then come up with one that was going to be the best one a bigger design a couple of years later and a bigger design a couple of years later. Suppose Suppose they built a Hubble telescope so that it could be uh, built for, instead of a billion and a half, they could build it for, for $100 million each. They would have sent some up, the first one would have failed, nobody would have noticed. We got plenty more coming behind it. We got 15, 14 more on the assembly line. Next one looks better. The next one they put a different filter on. Next one they, they look more in the infrared. Uh, the robustness of the space program is definitely inhibited and dragged down by the fact that each program tries to take the entire budget with it. You can and afford it. And it's in itself, yeah. Yes, and, and that's right. And to me, space is more than that. Uh, you know, I'm not in the space business to get a paycheck. Uh, in fact, the <laughs> fact is I'm unemployed right now. I was laid off by Rockwell. Uh, I'm in, in space because I believe that we can make this a great venture that uh, I brought along my oldest boy here. I'd like to be the world's first Martian. <laughs> as soon as I'm certain that my rocket is safe to fly on. He's going to Mars. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, 
and it's it's not going to happen. You're not going to Mars at ten thousand dollars a pound to Some get to orbit. Some parents would do anything to keep their teenagers out of trouble. Yes, uh, but I think that this this is the sort of thing that okay. can change the infrastructure sufficiently that each dollar goes further, and I think there will be more spent on space as people perceive it as less as being a you know a huge money pit. 1.5 billion dollar satellites are, are perceived as that. That's what's happening in Washington. JPL has seen the uh, seen the writing on the wall. Uh, JPL is going into microsats. They're looking to how can we get a 200 pound payload that can do the same function as a 2,000 pound uh, uh, Voyager, and they send dozens of these to uh, to look at asteroids. No longer have a situation where where all the prestige is riding on one Galileo and get the cost down. In other words, why should, if, if we continue the way we're doing, NASA is going to, by default, going to have to come up with a policy that says, you see one asteroid, you see them all. And I don't see that myself, but to me, asteroids are fascinating. And every single planetary and asteroid encounter that, that we have ever had has come back with surprises. We've seen volcanoes in Io. We've seen uh, nitrogen geysers on on uh, what? Triton. Triton, yes. Uh, we've seen unexpected things at every planet we've seen, and to say and to say that we can only look at one one or two asteroids because that's our budget. And to me, Gaspra and uh, Ida that they're going to see are boring asteroids. To me, the the exciting asteroids are the ones uh, beyond Jupiter, for example, uh, between Jupiter and Saturn. They've got one that's uh, 200 kilometers in diameter, and, is, and they think it's really a comet. It's in an unstable orbit. If anything that's between Jupiter and Saturn is going to be pushed out of orbit, and eventually could become a huge um, comet because it's probably frozen gases. Yes. Yeah, that picture of the surface of the comet. Yeah, we got some pictures of. Uh, uh, there's the pictures of the Halley's Comet. They're not really good. I'd like to see something parked in one of these comets and watch these. Not not watch these. They now know a lot more about comets. They they actually have jets or thrusters. They're they're not just fizzling all over the surface. They've got areas like volcanoes that's spewing gases. I'd like to see uh, see America afford to be able to put probes on these things to to look at. For, there's something like 20 classes of asteroids. Not to fly by Pluto, but to actually put it something in orbit to watch this thing for long periods of time. You can't do that when you're mass limited, and you're mass limited economically, and it's ten thousand dollars a pound. The only way you're going to do that is if you bring the cost of getting to space way down, and then suddenly the possibilities open wide open. Any other questions? I think that's my conclusion, probably. And I think that this is a, this is a good theoretical cost here. And this is this somewhere between two twenty and five hundred dollars a pound would be a good commercial price to pay, and at five hundred dollars a pound even would have a very robust space program, and it wouldn't. And suddenly the the amount spent by the government, while it would go way up, there would be a lot more commercial enterprise in space. That's another thing too. Is even if if it was economical at five thousand dollars a pound, if there was a huge demand. Even at that price, it could be filled. Is the capability isn't there? Um, yes, the, the fact they have what they can spend seventeen billion dollars, or well, that was an old figure for ALS, just they can have a heavy lift booster so they can actually put it up in space to, to marshal a, a Mars mission. Now, is that your design? Yeah, that's my design. We'll bring it back up. Uh, this with the capability of, of uh, lifting fifteen thousand pounds to low Earth orbit. Uh, would only be about 40 feet high from the bottom of the engines to the top of each of the seven rockets. The payload is, uh, increases your height. Uh, and for that size, about a third of a million dollars per launch, seven and a half tons capability, eight hours from the time you roll it out from the shop until you launch it in space. Very inexpensive, 73 pressure fed engines that cost $400 to $2,600 per engine. That's not millions, hundred. Uh, we're talking low numbers, uh, all industrial in design. It's a little heftier. A thing with a with a dry weight of eighty thousand pounds is about three times as much as an Atlas Centaur. 
of a uh, similar capacity would have. It's pretty heavy, it's pretty beefy. How is that, is it freestanding or? Yes, it's uh, free, yes, because, the, the, see the Atlas is not freestanding, is it? Well, It'll stand on this, with so many compound, you know, units like that, they'd have to have almost a special transporter for it, and, uh, and you know, like the shuttle's held by boosters, how, how is this one uh, supported? With, with First stage would have, would, it would have the, uh, the, uh, the ground contact. All the load would, would pass through, uh, through tension loads from the inner to the outer along the same as if you unfolded it like it had those seven uh, out. Um, and all the, the ground load would be held by the, by the outer first stage. Through the skin of, of the uh, tank or? Yes, in fact, the, the ground loads, if, if this thing's pressurized to 500 PSI, no problem. And if, it, if it's dry, then it's again no problem. The only time you would have a problem on this thing would be is if, if you're talking about the thickness of the skin with flight loads, unpressurized it wouldn't do, but it has to be pressurized to fly. Would this be over a flame trench of some type, just a flat surface? Yes, uh, the flame trench would be uh, somewhat less. Have you ever seen the, uh, uh, the SL-4 when it takes off? It's got 20 meat engines and, uh, and uh, 12 vernier engines. It goes up into a canyon. Yeah, it goes off into a canyon. But, but the main thing about that one is it looks very, the characteristic of it is very interesting. The flame doesn't look very long. It looks very bright and in a very small, it looks like a small flame to it. it will spread out a little bit more. The same thing we could have with this kind of a flame. The, the flame of 20,000 pound engines has a characteristic length. 200,000 is longer. Well, by having a cluster of this, each one of the flames is relatively small, and so your flame bucket actually will be, uh, would be uh, easier to fabricate. But it would be concrete. It'd still have concrete and water, deluge and sort. Uh, a flame bucket itself is merely a concrete structure which is not very uh, expensive. The expensive things are the mobile gantries and so forth. That's one of the transport system and, and, and uh, the path, the high cost items. Yes, uh, I mean, the Russians use uh, railroad to get it out there. Yeah. This thing could fit easily on a railroad car. Actually, this would be work best straddled between two railroad flat cars till you get out there and, and and hydraulically lowered a little bit to, hit, to reach the, the pad connections. Well, they got scaffolding that comes up like flour around it. Yeah, they have a, the, the, they have that, the, that, theirs is a little different, but I would have visualized something different from both the American way of having a full gantry around it, which is a, basically a, a 50 story high building that moves back, well, it's not like 30 it's on story rails. On, on rails. That's, that's a real high uh, capital item. The Russians have very little capital out there. My visualization would be, for example, of this size would probably come out on rails, railroad cars pushing out, and railroad tank cars to supply the propellant and move them out of the way when, when you're ready to launch. Uh, a smaller version, if we were talking about one that would be only 20 feet high, one that would come out basically on the back of a truck, um, a, a flatbed truck would, would be able to transport it empty and then fill it at the site. The only thing you're doing at the site that I see is, uh, as being critical is you don't put the propellant in it until you get to the site. As you're moving this thing out towards the site, you can add things to it. You can add the uh, pressurizing fluids. You can add hydrazine. You can put a payload on top of it. You can virtually pass under bridges where you drop a payload on. But uh, the last thing at the site, you do have to have a LOX connection and a kerosene connection.